I'm looking forward to seeing it. This is VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from Brian Lynn, Anna Mateo, and Dan Friedel. Later, Armin Kasabian answers a question from a learner in this week's Ask a Teacher. We close with an American story. This week, it is William Wilson, Part 2. But first, here is Brian Lynn. China's decision to ban BBC World News from its television networks suggests increased government efforts to restrict foreign media. The ban took effect on February 11th. It was ordered shortly after the BBC produced a series of stories about ethnic Uyghur women in China's Xinjiang region. China's order also came after the British agency in charge of broadcasting canceled the official permission of China's CGTN news network to operate in Britain. British officials said the decision was linked to CGTN's ties to China's ruling Communist Party. In the series, the women reported abuse in government-run internment camps. More than a million people are estimated to be detained in such camps and in prisons across Xinjiang. The Chinese government has described the internment camps as job training centers and schools. It says the camps are necessary to fight Islamic extremism and a Uyghur separatist movement. But former camp detainees have repeatedly reported abusive treatment in the camps. China accused the BBC of reporting false news in its coverage of the internment camps. The government has also criticized BBC for reports about the COVID-19 pandemic in China. China's main broadcasting regulator or controller announced the ban in a statement. It accused the BBC of violating government rules about reporting on China. The news organization had, the statement read, failed to meet the requirements to broadcast in China as an overseas channel. Hu Shijin, editor of the Chinese government-run Global Times newspaper, tweeted that the reports were all false. He added that the BBC has become a bastion of the Western public opinion war against China. The action against the BBC adds to an increasingly difficult reporting environment in China. At least 17 journalists were expelled from China in 2020. The Foreign Correspondents Club of China said in a statement in September. Several had their media identifications canceled after the United States declared a number of Chinese media organizations in America as foreign missions. Sari Aro Havrin is a China expert based in Brussels. She says the Chinese government wants to establish a new world media order. With media in China already under strong control, 
the government is likely to make foreign media the next target, Havran told VOA. The BBC ban demonstrates how foreign media operating in China is increasingly treated as domestic media, meaning that the reporting from China that is not in line with the official party line will become increasingly sensitive and risky, Havran added. China's aim to restrict news covering sensitive issues within the country is nothing new. The government feels Western media unfairly targets and misrepresents local issues in the country. Government-run media or officials in China often describe such reports as fake news. The group Reporters Without Borders produces the World Press Freedom Index, a yearly report on 180 countries. It named China the third most restrictive country in terms of media freedoms. One Beijing-based foreign reporter told VOA that Chinese citizens are becoming less willing to speak with foreign media. He said nine out of ten locals cancel meetings planned with reporters. The reporter asked not to be identified, fearing he might be punished for his words. Less and less people want to talk to us, he said, adding, They are always afraid. I'm Brian Lin. London Zoo is one of the city's most visited places. During normal times, it is filled with visitors, both young and old. However, as the coronavirus crisis continues, the zoo is once again in lockdown, meaning no visitors at all. No one to watch. Silly monkeys play in trees. Dangerous king cobras sun on rocks. Or friendly penguins slide down slippery surfaces. Besides that, the lockdown is causing great economic harm. Every month, without visitors, costs the zoo about $1.4 million. Reuters News Agency reports. So the future of the world's oldest scientific zoo is unclear. We are losing so much money, zoo employee Kate Sanders told Reuters. I'm concerned the zoo might not survive. Sanders is the team leader for big cats at the zoo. She added that having no visitors has been a really sad time for the zoo. Located in Regent's Park in central London, the London Zoo was opened in 1828 by the Zoological Society of London. Charles Darwin visited while writing his Origin of Species. Queen Elizabeth II is the zoo's patron. But famous connections will not be enough to keep the zoo open with no visitors. The zoo has already faced millions of pounds in losses, and the latest lockdown is again keeping visitors away, even during the usually busy school holidays. The London Zoo was forced to close for 18 weeks in 2020, Reuters reported. That lockdown caused the zoo to lose 15 million pounds. The latest lockdown is expected to cost another 1.8 million. The caretakers of the animals, the zookeepers, are sad and anxious. The Zoological Society of London also owns Whipsnade Zoo, located north of London. Together, the two zoos care for nearly 23,000 animals. All those animals need feeding, 
and other kinds of care. So the number of zookeepers cannot be reduced any more than it has already. We can't furlough animals, said Catherine England, chief operating officer of the London Zoo. And you can't furlough all the staff who look after the animals. It just remains so sad that we are closed, she added. I'm Ana Mateo. The United Nations Cultural Agency may consider the making of French bread, known as the baguette, for its list of intangible treasures. Bakers in France asked the French government to propose the traditional bread for the honor from UNESCO. About six million baguettes are sold every day in France. The French Minister of Culture will make a recommendation to UNESCO in March. The baguette is competing against two other candidates for France's nomination. The candidates are the metal rooftops of buildings in Paris made from zinc and a wine festival in the country's Jura area. In 2020, UNESCO considered things such as a dance in Zambia, camel racing in the United Arab Emirates, and pottery making in Serbia for its list of treasures. Bakers in France hope the baguette will be considered an official treasure because of its importance in French life. But the bakers also are worried the baguette is becoming less important in France. They say it is being replaced by frozen bread that gets produced in factories and sold in supermarkets. They want to protect small traditional bread makers. Many of the small bakeries had a difficult year in 2020 because of coronavirus restrictions. Since the 1950s, about 30,000 small bakeries closed in France as supermarkets became popular. Food and drink-making methods in other countries are already considered treasures by UNESCO. The organization recognizes the making of flat breads in Iran and Kazakhstan, Neapolitan pizza making in Italy, and beer making in Belgium. In 1993, the French government declared rules for bread to be considered a baguette. It must be made only from water, flour, yeast, and salt. The declaration noted the time and temperature for the uncooked bread to rise. I'm Dan Friedel. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Victor, who is from Brazil. Hello, my name is Victor. Can you talk about the use of the words security and safety? What's the difference between these two words? Best regards. Dear Victor, thank you for the email. While the words security and safety are nouns with similar meanings, they are used differently. Security often has to do with a group's efforts to protect its members from harm. Safety most often relates to a personal feeling of being free from harm or danger. Security seems to define efforts and measures that are outside of an individual, while safety is closer to an inner feeling. 
Here is a simple discussion to show the difference. Did you think about safety when you moved to that neighborhood? Yes, I did. Luckily, there is a security guard at the front door of the apartment. In English, you may hear the word security used to describe people with the job of protecting a place. It is also used to describe efforts to protect the country. The U.S. has the Department of Homeland Security so that its citizens can feel safe. You may see some government buildings with high security measures to stop people from entering. Individuals, organizations, and governments value cybersecurity to stop people from causing harm to computers and equipment through the internet. Here is one example. Cybersecurity helps stop enemies from stealing private information. We would not say cyber safety when talking about measures to protect the nation's computer systems. Cybersecurity, instead, describes the effort to stop others from attacking. Here is another example. In factories or workshops, workers need to wear face coverings or other protection, like safety glasses for their eyes. But such glasses are not called security glasses. That is because they relate to one's personal safety. They protect you from dangers like dust, viruses, flying objects, or chemicals. I need to wear a face covering for my safety, to avoid breathing in these chemicals. This person wants to be free from harm, so she used her safety mask. As a result, she follows job safety measures. Thank you again for the question, Victor. And to our listeners everywhere, what question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Armin Kasabian. William Wilson, Part 2 In the first part of my story, I spoke about my life at my first school and about the other boys, over whom I gained firm control. But there was one boy who would not follow my commands, who would not do what I told him to as the other boys did. His name was the same as mine, William Wilson. Although he did not belong to my family in any way, he seemed to feel some love for me and had entered the school the same day as I had. Many of the boys thought we were brothers. I soon discovered that we had been born on the same day, January 19th, 1809. Wilson continued his attempts to command me, while I continued my attempts to rule him. The strange thing is that, although I did not like him, I could not hate him. We had a battle nearly every day, it is true. In public it would seem that I had been proved the stronger, but he seemed somehow able to make me feel that this was not true, and that he himself was stronger. Nevertheless, we continued to talk to each other in a more or less friendly way. On a number of subjects, we agreed very well. I sometimes thought that if we had met at another time and place, we might have become friends. It is not easy to explain my real feelings toward him. There was no love, and there was no fear, yet I saw something to honor in him. I wanted to learn more about him. 
Anyone experienced in human nature will not need to be told that Wilson and I were always together. This strange appearance of friendship, although we were not friends, caused no doubt the strangeness of battle between us. I tried to make the others laugh at him. I tried to give him pain while seeming to play a light-hearted game. My attempts were not always successful, even though my plans were well made. There was much about his character that simply could not be laughed at. I could find, indeed, but one weakness. Perhaps he had been born with it, or perhaps it had come from some illness. No one but me would have made any use of it against him. He was able to speak only in a very, very soft, low voice. This weakness I never failed to use in any way that was in my power. Wilson could fight back, and he did. There was one way he had of troubling me beyond measure. I had never liked my name. Too many other people had the same name. I would rather have had a name that was not so often heard. The word sickened me. When on the day I arrived at the school, a second William Wilson came also, I felt angry with him for having the name. I knew I would have to hear the name each day a double number of times. The other William Wilson would always be near. The other boys often thought that my actions and my belongings were his, and his were mine. My anger grew stronger with every happening that showed that William Wilson and I were alike in body or in mind. I had not then discovered the surprising fact that we were of the same age, but I saw that we were of the same height, and I saw that in form and in face we were also much the same. Nothing could trouble me more deeply, although I carefully tried to keep everyone from seeing it than to hear anyone say anything about the likeness between us of mind or of body or of anything else. But in truth, I had no reason to believe that this likeness was ever noticed by our schoolfellows. He saw it, and as clearly as I, that I knew well. He discovered that in this likeness he could always find a way of troubling me. This proved the more than usual sharpness of his mind. His method, which was to increase the likeness between us, lay both in words and in actions, and he followed his plan very well indeed. It was easy enough to have clothes like mine. He easily learned to walk and move as I did. His voice, of course, could not be as loud as mine, but he made his manner of speaking the same. Ah, oh, how greatly this most careful picture of myself troubled me. I will not now attempt to tell. It seemed that I was the only one who noticed it. I was the only one who saw Wilson's strange and knowing smiles, pleased with having produced in my heart the desired result. He seemed to laugh within himself and cared nothing that no one laughed with him. I have already spoken of how he seemed to think he was better and wiser than I. He would try to guide me. He would often try to stop me from doing things I had planned. He would tell me what I should and should not do, and he would do this not openly, but in a word or two in which I had to look for the meaning. As I grew older, I wanted less and less to listen to him. As it was, I could not be happy under his eyes that always watched me. Every day I showed more and more openly that I did not want to listen to anything he told me. 
I have said that in the first years when we were in school together, my feelings might easily have been turned to friendship. But in the later months, although he talked to me less often then, I almost hated him. Yet let me be fair to him. I can remember no time when what he told me was not wiser than would be expected from one of his years. His sense of what was good or bad was sharper than my own. I might today be a better and happier man if I had more often done what he said. It was about the same period, if I remember rightly, that by chance he acted more openly than usual, and I discovered in his manner something that deeply interested me. Somehow he brought to mind pictures of my earliest years. I remembered, it seemed, things I could not have remembered. These pictures were wild, half-lighted and not clear, but I felt that very long ago I must have known this person standing before me. This idea, however, passed as quickly as it had come. It was on this same day that I had my last meeting at the school with this other strange William Wilson. That night, when everyone was sleeping, I got out of bed, and with a light in my hand, I went quietly through the house to Wilson's room. I had long been thinking of another of those plans to hurt him, with which I had until then had little success. It was my purpose now to begin to act according to this new plan. Having reached his room, I entered without a sound. Leaving the light outside, I advanced a step and listened. He was asleep. I turned and took the light and again went to the bed. I looked down upon his face. The coldness of ice filled my whole body. My knees trembled. My whole spirit was filled with horror. I moved the light nearer to his face. Was this, this the face of William Wilson? I saw, indeed, that it was. But I trembled as if with sickness as I imagined that it was not. What was there in his face to trouble me so? I looked and my mind seemed to turn in circles in the rush of my thoughts, it was not like this, surely not like this, that he appeared in the daytime. The same name, the same body, the same day that we came to school. And then there was his use of my way of walking, my manner of speaking. Was it in truth humanly possible that what I now saw was the result, and the result only, of his continued efforts to be like me? Filled with wonder and fear, cold and trembling, I put out the light. In the quiet darkness I went from his room, and without waiting one minute, I left that old school and never entered it again. Mm -hmm.